Hi, this is Private Hero Station, and today we're bringing you day 202 of uh, the war in Ukraine, done in a conversation form between Alexei Rostovich, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition journalist. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Tuesday, 13th of September, 4 minutes past 10 in Kiev, and we're doing another stream, day 202, with Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you, Alexei. Good evening, everybody. We have over 200,000 watching us live, 35,000 of you clicked the like button. Please uh, subscribe to Fagin Live and to Alexei Rostovich. Uh, and of course, if you are listening, watching that in English, subscribe to the Privateer Station. So without further ado, let's start. What is that? What do you have there? Uh, marker. I was thinking maybe some special attribute for this stream. Oh, it's a magic wand. Uh, okay, so wave your, so to say, magic wand and um, let's see what's up on the front. Okay, we're commenting the enemy complaints. We're not reviewing our intel. We're looking at what enemy calls up for now. So they're screaming that uh, Ukraine troops are storming Liman. We don't say that, they do. And another thing they're saying that all of a sudden in the direction of Siversk there was some movement. I don't know if that is true, I'm just discussing what is uh, being published and commented in the Russian forums. So Liman is uh, down at around 6 o'clock on this map, uh, right next to Slavyansk. And Liman is still red. As you can see, there are two... Possible paths to surround Liman, uh, and the enemies are complaining that all of a sudden Ukraine is pushing near Svetogorsk, uh, the tentacle protrusion, and also Ukraine somehow is uh, expanding their presence on the other bank of the river, right in the middle of the map, where you can see they already had some of it, but uh, they're saying that. Ukraine is uh, advancing further, and there are comments about uh, Liman being taken, possibly soon. So, I don't know if we can trust that, but uh, that's what they're afraid of. Then let's go to Siversk. So, imagine if uh, Ukraine army will continue going slightly above the middle of this map, okay, now at 12 o'clock towards Svatova. Uh, that is at 12 o'clock on this map. This is, uh, Svatova is in right smack in the middle of junction of different roads. So if Ukraine army gets that area, then uh, first of all, they can easily travel down south. And also they are blocking a lot of transport routes for the Russian army. And any offensive goes much faster around roads. Uh, so every offensive goes about 10 times faster by the road than uh, just uh, unusual terrain. And it's a bit harder to create a block on the road to effectively block the, block the advancing army. And some of them are discussing that we might uh, take Svatova and then go down south the road and cut Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, which are at 5 o'clock on this map, down south by the green tents. And there actually are some voices of concern saying that uh, Ukraine may retake Severodonetsk and Lysychansk eventually after these events. Um, there are more uh, interesting things happening in Sporne near Siversk. This is a uh, 6 o'clock uh, yellow area covered uh, on the map. That Russia are saying that 
They have some issues there. And uh, Russian troops are relocating more uh, detachments to that area. Why? Because they're also saying that Ukraine military captured a lot of prisoners, a lot of uh, troops that surrendered. So they're trying to refortify that. Let's go south. Bakhmut. Um, they claimed that they got out to Bakhmut and even captured some outskirts of the city. Our general command refuted that claim and said Bakhmut is still ours. And we do believe our command more than we believe Russian uh, propagandists. So they indeed attempted to make a motion there, but they were kicked back. Nothing is working, neither to the north of Bakhmut, nor to the south of it, as they try to continuously trying to encircle it. And once again, these are the 20 kilometers out of the 1300 mile long front where they're trying to do any offensive. No, nowhere else, right? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, any other place? We talked about Pesky and other things. Um, nope, nothing worth mentioning. There are some tactical actions near Pesky, um, but they're very low tactical level. Basically, a platoon of uh, one group attacking a detachment of another. So there are just some motions to keep the pressure and produce the effect of presence. And even they, they uh, waste their resources, their precious resources at the moment. Um, let's go down south towards the Zaporozhye region. We cannot claim anything yet, but they're saying that Ukraine army has uh, accumulated enough force there. And we've done it throughout the whole wide front in Zaporozhye. And they're not even sure about the exact area of offensive that we are supposedly uh, going to exploit. And I'm just describing what they're saying. Then let's go to Kherson, Kherson area. There are interesting things happening there. Evil tongues in Russian forums. This map doesn't show that, but they're saying that Ukrainians from Posad Pakrovska near Kherson, on that yellow road connecting Kherson with Nikolaev, 9 o'clock with uh, 6 o'clock, well, the other way around. Kherson is on the 6, Nikolaev is on the 9. There is a yellow road going there, so Posad Pakrovska on the border between green and red has been taken by Ukraine, according to Russian forums, and that is pretty close to Kherson already. And, of course, uh, our side continues to take out uh, the Russians on the other bank, actually on both bank of uh, Dnieper, with Heimars, and if you read their statements or inter listen to the intercepts, they're complaining that they really have no place to maneuver, they keep being shot at, and uh, soldiers are complaining that they wanted to leave the area to cross back the river, but they don't have this option now. So the operation continues, as we said. Forbes recently published, um, I don't know where they took it, uh, but I think we can trust them. Oh, according to the data of General Command, so they took it from General Command. And they stated that uh, we destroyed 590 pieces of equipment, over 5,000 occupants. Uh, the most expensive was uh, radio location anti-battery system, 59 millions. Um, we also shot down, actually they lost three SU-34s. Uh, we shot down two, one uh, crashed in Crimea, another uh, worthy of mention is the counter-battery system, Zoopark, uh, $25 million, 106 artillery system, 200 vehicles, uh, a number of tanks, and not all the equipment was destroyed in terms of vehicles. 
because we also captured uh, 129 items of equipment, including self-propelled and towable howitzers. And these are just the elements they could track on the videos that are confirmed in reality. I would confirm here that we got equipment enough for probably two brigades. Imagine we just outfitted two brigades with uh, pretty good equipment. So Russian Federation is the main supplier of uh, military equipment for the Ukraine army after the United States. And they're actually number one in some categories. All right, we've been live for about 10 minutes. 360,000 people watching us live, over 90,000 clicked the like button. Some people are complaining about the noises. Um, we're trying to manage it somehow. Uh, apologies, Alexei, I think, has something in his studio, in his uh, place where he is at. I think you saw that uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan border flared up again. Why is it so remarkable? Of course, they have their own war there. Uh, request uh, from Armenian government to Putin um, as an appeal in terms of uh, their common defense structure uh, organization uh, and uh, Putin's basically neglecting that appeal. And another thing coming from that area, uh, in Georgia there is a party called Dream, Mejda, that is uh, planning to perhaps fire up something on the Georgian borders and perhaps recapture, capture, uh, liberate the area that uh, was occupied by Russia a few years ago. It's probably too early to speak about Georgia, but I think they have other issues. And since their leading government is um, connected with uh, Ivanishvili and they are probably vulnerable to the situation and Russian losses on the fronts. And also, people are talking that uh, Moscow might replace Pashinyan, uh, the name of Ardayan is being mentioned. So all that is directed at uh, replacement of management. Uh, and supposedly it is directed at replacing Armenian leadership that for the one that will help Armenia to join Russia or become part of Russia. So can, what would you comment about that region that uh, started uh, these interesting movements? I'm thinking Azerbaijan is just fulfilling the initial goals of their campaign. I don't know their condition of military uh, forces. Maybe Russia intervened or maybe something else was there in the 20th, in 1920s. They stopped that military action. They were uh, securing certain areas. And yeah, back then there was an incident with a Russian plane that they was shot down and they had some negotiations and Azerbaijan people were upset that uh, their operation was stopped. And I back then said, do not worry, there will be an option for you to continue. So after that, they just continued to slowly creep up and their goal is to create a corridor between uh, main Azerbaijan and Hichivan, so they can have communication with their enclave. And I think Russian leadership uh, signed an agreement between themselves, Azerbaijan and Turkey, to uh, allow them to do that, probably to exchange in exchange for some oil and gas or something else. And Armenians, uh, in opinion of Kremlin, are not understanding their happiness. They could have been making money on that, but uh, instead they're fighting for that land. So Moscow is sort of trying to pretend they're helping Armenia, but in fact is actually trading with uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey. And I think uh, Azerbaijan will achieve what they want there. Kremlin he is trying to get Armenia closer into its orbit, at the same time having trade with Azerbaijan and Turkey. So that's 
An interesting story. I wish Armenian people to get rid of their illusions about Russia. And the moment Russia actually extracts itself from that region, there will be chances for these countries to actually sit down, find peace and agree to certain terms on the peace talks. Because uh, Russian goal there is to divide and conquer. We'll see that that defense organization of uh, some of the ex-USSR or DKB uh, org is a kind of useless uh, because Russia even refused to interve intervene on the side of Armenia into this conflict. And Putin doesn't really need that because he's got other agreements about this corridor. And I would say that Armenian people will need a lot of courage to and resolve to deal with that situation. And however hard it may sound, I would suggest Armenia to start looking for ways to negotiate with Azerbaijan and Turkey directly. Because Russia is not there on their side. Russia is not going to help them. The only goal of Russia is to attach Crimea to add them as an appendage to their own territory and then perhaps also sell something to Azerbaijan. Regarding the relation of these uh, events to what's happening in Ukraine, it's possible, but they have their own logic in that region. And it's been unfolding for about 30-something years, and especially kind of more uh, flaring up in the last two years. So, about Georgia, Kovacidze, the head of that uh, Georgian party, Dream, I don't have any issues with Georgian leadership, they have issues with me. And, you know, their issues with me, it's their issues. I could care less. Um, I have good relations with Georgian people, this is my small home. That's where I was born. I have good relations with their media, with people. And uh, their leading party in Georgia is actually pretty connected with Moscow, so it's interesting to see the dynamic that will happen. And by the way, I don't know what is happening with my sound. We tried all kind of things. I suspect somebody from Moscow decided to try to interfere with our streams here. Because they don't want 550,000 people watching the updates. But uh, we'll figure it out. See, the moment I mentioned them, the noise disappeared. Just like in the army. If uh, something doesn't work, you need to introduce yourself. Lieutenant Colonel Aristovich. Okay, we have uh, 410,000 people watching us live. I'm doing another little pause here to see if we can do something about the sound. But I think sometimes we just need to accept that as uh, external factors. That's uh, probably uh, some military suppression tactic by Russia. So we'll be yelling through that noise. Okay, in Armenia there was... Uh, more situational heat up, but people are asking for Pashinyan to resign, the Prime Minister. See, even in Armenia they have opposition. The only place where they have no opposition is Russian Federation. Okay, let's go back to armaments. President Zelensky turned uh, to Washington with another request to supply certain munitions, uh, such as Atakams, uh, long-range uh, missiles for HIMARS. We're still keeping some level of intrigue here, if that question is solved, if you know or not. Um, and do you think Russian attacks on your infrastructure, such as electric station in Kharkov, uh, is uh, pushing the West allies to expedite support. Because I think these events, in my opinion, they definitely produce certain impression. They were a bunch of statements by European and American leaders. And as you noticed, some European countries completely stopped taking any requests from Russians for visa. Uh, for visas. Some countries around Netherlands, uh, Baltic countries, Poland. So 
Russian citizens cannot get visas uh, to these countries or through these countries to Europe. So that's, I guess, part of the reaction to this uh, inhumane uh, shut up of uh, civil infrastructure to Ukraine by Putin's regime. So what do you say? When are we going to see these new armaments on the battle theater? Yeah, I understand that uh, Schultz uh, also called Putin, and he did. Uh, he was very. It was a rough conversation. He uh, said that uh, he requested Russia to withdraw and only then to sit down and negotiate. And that Germany is uh, vehemently opposing any uh, attack on the civil targets, deliberate attack on civil targets. Um, we also have an article published by General Zaluzhny last week. He wrote it last week, but the logic was the same. And he's saying that it's really about arithmetic. Arith arithmetic. arithmetic. And he said that um, if Russian Federation can hit our targets from about uh, 2,000 miles and we can only reach them at 100 miles, that's uh, unacceptable. Because there will be a situation at some point when Russia will withdraw from Ukraine territory but will continue shooting up Ukraine from their territory. So we need uh, some parity weapons to be able to provide understanding for Russia that um, in case of continuous fire, they will be shot back. At. So this is the logic of our military command, and uh, that's it. that is what they're insisting upon, that we need to have parity weapons to be able to respond to Russian aggression. Alexei, this is really bad with the sound. There is complete hell in our chat. Right now it's a little better. Or seems to be. Dear friends, we do have uh, some problems with audio today. I hope we'll overcome that. I think now it seems to be working. Give me a second. All right, regarding negotiations, the head of uh, Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitry Kuleba, in his uh, statement said goals of Russia did not change, either a complete defeat or reloading of Ukraine. This was his reaction about uh, regarding the screams from Moscow about uh, negotiations and uh, attempts to get back to negotiating table uh, caused by Ukraine success in Kharkov area. So they're trying to engage Ukraine one way or another, basically pleading for negotiations with Ukraine. Do you think uh, that situation changed at all? Um, what else can explain Moscow activity on that front um, besides the fact that they're losing in a Kharkov region? I think the main factor is their, uh, is their defeat, is their, the, that Ukrainian army crushed them in Kharkov region and that we are crushing them in Kherson and perhaps there'll be a third direction someplace. And uh, our officials did state that uh, Putin's regime reached out for negotiations after Kharkov disaster to Ukraine and uh, Ukraine refused to discuss anything. The only condition for negotiations is uh, for Russia to withdraw completely to the borders before February 24, and then maybe we can discuss some things. But again, they will not be like Minsk 1 or 2 agreements. There'll be definite uh, other kind of agreements uh, with reparations and uh, retributions included for the damage caused in Ukraine. There was another document uh, published by Yermak uh, Rasmussen Commission, uh, Kiev Security Agreement. 
And all these statements on both sides are framing that document. This is a fundamental material, and it solves five different tasks. I'm kind of curious what that sound, where is it coming from? Can you find the origin, the point of origin of that noise and just smash them? I don't know, Mark, we've been trying to find where is it coming from for half a day. Maybe it's some new ways to produce remote interference. We'll figure it out maybe tomorrow. So first goal of that uh, document is uh, to affirm our entry and our pathway to NATO and that uh, safety agreement only cements that, that Ukraine uh, general goal is to join NATO. Second is that the main guarantee for Ukraine is its ability to defend itself from um, any aggression. And that leads to the need for Ukraine to have a strong army, strong defense that would even uh, push enemy to not uh, to consider not attacking, as it will be futile. Uh, third, if the enemy still attacks, uh, then the guarantor countries provide uh, immediate assistance in military equipment and uh, other ways. And that gives, by the way, a reason theater for the old Europe, which was afraid of Russia for so long. Uh, now they're finally shaking off uh, that shadow of Russia on them, and Ukraine is basically providing them cover on the eastern side. And since we're holding that mad dog on the chain and resisting its advances, uh, dear European uh, colleagues, please uh, understand that and help us do that work for you and perhaps for other countries, not just for Ukraine. And uh, one should understand it's not just Ukraine that is in that situation. Any other country can get there. And uh, if other country is uh, invaded, Ukraine uh, will also be uh, able and would uh, be eager to provide help. It's understandable, this document is a draft, but it will be discussed, and it did not appear by itself. Sorry, what's up with the sound? I don't know. Something is happening. We can wait through the noise, uh, it lasts a little bit, and then we can continue. So, for now the sound is good, let's go on. Let's also go back to liberated Kharkov region. That story with teachers, I started doing some research on that. It appears there is not a single Russian citizen that is being captured are detained in Ukraine. They're mostly talking, it appears that the most uh, are actually Ukrainian teachers who remained in the occupied territories and it's about a hundred of them and they actually travel to the Russian territory for uh, some continuous education, so to say. Um, so we saw that statement by Irina Verishuk and then we haven't seen more information about them. And Russian side said that these teachers uh, do not exist. Well, good thing. If there are no Russian teachers, Russian citizens there, good for them. Uh, we'll figure out issues with uh, our citizens. But the main thing, what we did, we warned them that uh, it's not worth coming and that they should understand uh, what is going to wait for them if they do. And in Kherson, yeah, I know for sure there are Russian citizens who came there to teach and uh, bring the word of Russian wisdom uh, from Putin's regime. Yeah, we'll get there and then we'll deal with that issue. I had a stream with uh, Yeroshenko today and there is actually some evidence about um, of murder and torture on the territory of Kharkov region. Um, how big is that in comparison with um, 
Bucha in Kiev region, or is it bigger, smaller, similar? No, it is not uh, yet compared in size, but uh, it's definitely not hundreds, but uh, there could be dozens. Dozens of victims of occupants. So how would you connect that? How is it related to Bucha? Is it different uh, troops or there was any disciplinary action after Bucha or why Bucha was different from what was happening in Kharkov? I think Kiev region and Bucha was special circumstances situation where Russian troops were blocked in the cul de sac and couldn't leave and they've been fired upon and they were pretty angry and pissed off and uh, you know commanders just a joint of different factors in Kharkov region this uh, and in Kiev this is definitely a front line in Kharkov the front line was further out so they were not expecting it to come back and they were of course, looking for possible Ukraine supporters, but this is different from when you're being shelled daily. So I think it was a different uh, push. They were looking for businessmen to mine money, to extort, and then they were looking for maybe pro-Ukrainian activists. And it seemed like a second phase of what was going on in Bucha. Bucha had three phases. Remember, we talked about that. First one was when they just rolled in and they were shooting at everything. Second was more systemic terror. And third, when they were leaving and shooting up the place. So Kharkov reminds of a second stage when it's um, uh, sort of a system terror. Hang on, there's that noise. I think it's one of your fans. So, I think it was systemic uh, issue here when they were trying to find some Ukrainian uh, partisans or Ukrainian supporters. But basically, out of all the locations were liberated, in every second or every fourth, they had a bit of a small prison and they were torturing some people. Our vice uh, chair of the Security Commission published some videos and pictures um, of the torture basement where they tortured people. They were using hammers to crush fingers. There's blood. Uh, there, so police will go investigate who was doing what and will do the tally and let the world know what uh, did uh, Russian occupants leave there. Okay, gotcha. We are 32 minutes live, 427,000 people watching us live, over 40,000 clicked the like button. Today our sound was sucky, right? Um, are we doing the stream tomorrow? Yes, we are, but nobody can guarantee that we'll have a better sound. We have some unknown uh, situation here, kind of a UFO type thing. Um, well, let's see let's, if we can do that stream tomorrow. Let's aim for the same 10 p.m. We hope that nothing will intervene and we'll try to address these quality issues. Uh, please do not panic, dear viewers. Uh, it's been 200 days of us doing streams. It's the first time that thing is happening, so we'll figure a way how to correct that. I thank our viewers. I thank Alexei. Same request. Please uh, share links to that uh, stream in your social media. Send it to those people who need to see that. Subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and to the Privateer Station if you are watching that in English. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 p.m., the usual time. Goodbye.